All right, so welcome everybody. Thank you for having me here. It really means a lot to me. Um, dealing with mental illness or how I learned to dislike myself less. Uh, I'm JD Flynn. I'm a technical architect at Genuine. We're a full service digital marketing agency. Um, it also means I'm technically not an architect. I just know how to put a site together. Uh, if you want to tweet about this, at JD does dev. If you're on any of the Drupal slacks, I'm Dorf. Uh, also, hashtag D4D Boston. And has anybody here heard of Osmi? Not very much. I'm going to go into detail about them quite a bit later, but it's a great organization. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to start off with a big friendly greeting. So hello. Your turn. Okay, there we go. <laughs> also, start off with a couple, a couple disclaimers. I'd like to cover my ass. Um, one, not a doctor. I'm not a mental health professional. I am not here to give advice. So if you take anything I say out and say, well, this guy said this, I'm going to go, nope, slide. Uh, not a legal professional either, so see above. Uh, I tend to swear without thinking about it. I'll try to keep it PG-13. For reference, PG-13 allows one F-bomb and tasteful nudity. I'm going to forego the latter and maybe get two F-bombs, okay? <laughs> uh, I'm going to go into quite a bit of detail about myself. And also, because this is UX track, it's not really a UX talk. It's more of a human experience talk. So just heads up there. So why are we here? Um, and I don't mean the big why are we here. I don't want to send anybody into an existential crisis. Uh, why are we here today? I'm here to talk with you about something that's very, very important to me, and hopefully it's important to you. I hope you're here because you want to take part in the conversation, or at least learn something. And I'm also here to tell a story in hopes that my story helps someone the way that somebody else's story helped me. So let's have a conversation, starting with you. Um, you're going to learn a lot about me, a lot, but I like to have an idea of who I'm talking with. So how many of you are developers, programmers, anything directly to make, uh, designers, anything related to making sites or programming, anything like that? The majority, okay. Uh, are any of you project managers, account managers, product owners, blah, blah, blah? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any of you in HR? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I wish that HR would attend these talks because they could benefit more than any of you in this room because when they benefit from learning, you all would benefit from it. Um, are any of you in upper management, like C-level presidents, you know, way up there? Okay. Still decent mix. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I have been doing Drupal and PHP for about six years. I've been doing HTML since the 90s. I had the best Angel Fire and Geo Cities pages you ever saw. Um, I started learning basic around the same time. Does anybody remember a magazine or TV show called 321 Contact? Yes. <laughs> yes. So in the back of it, for those of you who don't know, this really dating me, but they would print out a basic program, like 10, 20, 30, go to 10, and you would have to type it in by hand, no copy and paste here, and hope that it worked. That was my intro to, debug to debugging, and I wasn't very good at it, so I just get frustrated. Um, I also help organize MidCamp in Chicago, which is an awesome camp. You all should come. It's going to be March 18th through the 21st, I think, of next year. And if you get there early, you can see the River Guide Green. It's awesome. Uh, I also help organize the Drupal Chicago meetup. And before all this, in a previous life, I was a paramedic. Um, also, I have mental illnesses, in case the title didn't give it away. Why do I care about this? Why do I do this talk? Um, well, I suffered in silence for a very long time. Uh, I was in denial. I was afraid that admitting there was something wrong with me would make it real, that I had an illness, it would make it real. One of those situations where you're in perfect health until a doctor tells you otherwise. I worried that if I told people how I felt, what was going on in my head, they'd treat me differently. Uh, but since then, and we'll, we'll get the, the dot, dot, dot here in a minute, um, something I tell myself now, I'm not weak, I'm sick. I'm not damaged, I have a disease. It's not a choice, it's a condition. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about mental illness. I'm sure all of you have a general idea, but uh, what is it exactly? We don't have enough time for that. But um, it refers to a wide range of mental health conditions or disorders that affect your mood, thinking, and behavior. There's a book that is about this tall from the floor called the DSM. You're currently on the fifth edition of it. Uh, and that was published in 2013. First one was in 1952. 
1952, there were about 50 diagnoses listed. The last one had, DSM-5, um, had approximately 157 diagnoses, but if you add in modifiers like bipolar type 1, bipolar type 2, bipolar recurve depressive uh, symptoms, over 600 diagnoses. We'll, we'll go with a smaller number because you know, it's just easier that way. I'm also here because there's a stigma around mental illness. Um, in case you didn't know that, for centuries, people with mental illness were treated as less than, put in the same group as murderers, criminals, you know, just put them all away where we can't see them. It could be seen as demonic possession, burn them at the stake, you know, do they weigh more than a duck, burn them. And it's a Monty Python joke. Uh, I, um, but, you know, they, it led to people using mental illness as, a, as an insult. Oh, he's psycho. Create, oh, they're off their meds. Not cool. Um, it was also, people weren't seen as people. They were their disease. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the term people first or person first terminology. So there's a big difference between I am mentally ill and I am a person with mental illness. I'm putting I am a person in front of that. There was a study done uh, by Ohio State in 2016. It was published, I didn't link it to you, I didn't have time to put the citation on here. But they, they did a survey to about 220 students and on the survey there were just three or four words changed between the two. One of the questions was, would you feel safe living next to the mentally ill? Group B got, would you feel safe living next to a person with mental illness? The results were staggering for negative against where it was non-person first terminology. So you know, it, it goes for a lot of things. Don't make people their thing, make the thing part of the person. Um, there's also self stigma. Feeling that your disease defines you and that you're a burden. Got it. Um, then courtesy stigma, which is where Family members and loved ones feel shame and guilt for contributing to the illness. You know, hand on the forehead, what did I do? Where did I mess up? Why is my loved one like this? Oh, it's all my fault. But it, there's a lot of this uh, that really is undeserved for anybody. Now you may be asking, what do I have? Well, I have a personal issue queue. Uh, these are more issue tags and actual issues, but hopefully you get the idea. Um, I have major depression, anxiety, PTSD, ADHD, and I'm waiting on that free space for <laughs> mental illness bingo. Um, now I say that because there is a lot of coexistence, comorbidity between mental illnesses. A lot of shared symptoms, and it's even though the DSM-5 is this tall and has a checklist for every diagnosis, there's a lot of overlap. The Venn diagram between ADHD and PTSD is very, very high uh, combined. So let's define these a little bit for clarity. Major depression is not an officer in the military. It's the feelings of low self-worth or guilt and a reduced ability to enjoy life. What makes it major depression as opposed to lieutenant depression is symptoms that are present every day for at least two weeks. That's, that's one of the criteria. Anxiety disorder. Characterized by feelings of worry or fear that are strong enough to interfere with daily activities. Uh, and this comes from a little part of your brain right here. I know you probably can't read the text, but that's your amygdala, also known as your lizard brain. Base instincts. Uh, tells you to do one of four things. Fight, flight, feed, breed. That's it. Mine, the, the flight and fight responses are pretty damn high. Uh, I get the same response that somebody who's being chased by bears should get when I walk into a supermarket. And you know, that's kind of gotten a little bit under control, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here right now. Uh, but all it comes from there, just that little tiny spot. PTSD, failure to recover after experiencing or witnessing a terrifying event. So there's a psychologist who explained this to me in terms I can understand, computer terms, right after he asked me to fix his printer. And, <laughs> Uh, it was, think of your brain as a computer. Okay, I'm there. You've got your short-term memory and your long-term memory, right? Computers have RAM and hard disk, storage. You've got your CPU, that's basically you know, everything going together. When, when something happens 
that causes PTSD. It gets stuck in the RAM. It's connected directly to the CPU. It's faster memory. It's going back and forth really quick, and it's just there. It never moves back to the hard disk. So it gets stuck in your short-term memory. And because it's so close to, to, to the CPU of your brain, it, it sight, sound, smell, anything can make a person relive, not just remember, but relive these events. And that made a lot of sense to me, and then I charged him 50 bucks for fixing his printer. <laughs> ADHD. The varying degrees of hyperactivity, impulsivity, or inattention that lead to difficulty in academic, emotional, and social functioning. When I was a kid, I would daydream a lot. I wouldn't do homework, I wouldn't really do anything. I'd do okay on tests, but I, I was an average student just because, you know, screw the homework, I'm, I'm bored. Uh, or I was told to go burn off some energy, or pay attention. You know. that, that's not what really would have helped me. Now, I say I have all these, but I've only been getting treatment for a short time. I've only had mental illness for a short time, relatively speaking. Most of my life, I didn't get treatment. I just lived with this. This was a normal. And I'm going to get into that. But first, <laughs> just, just a little palate cleanser. Okay. All right, so my normal was not normal. For as long as I can remember, I felt this way. Now we could get into the nature versus nurture debate, but I, mean, I think there's two sides to that coin. You know, the nature, my brain is probably pre-wired for this kind of uh, functionality. But the nurture, my childhood was rough. And that's putting it mildly, it was rough. I witnessed a lot of physical and verbal abuse between the people who were supposed to provide a sense of security for me. They didn't. I was emotionally abused, which this can take many forms, and I went through a lot of them. Uh, I was left alone a lot from a very, very young age, which led to a hard time making connections, a hard time feeling safe around anybody. I had very, very few friends, um, overweight, ugly, bad hygiene, little guidance. I didn't, you know, my, the things that are supposed to be taught to children were not really taught to me. I was also bullied a lot because of all of the above, and I didn't know how to handle emotions so my lizard brain just said, I got this, and I cried a lot or I lashed out, fight or flight. You know, I'm either going to run away, scared in a fetal position, or I'm going to start yelling and get into fights. Because it started at such a young age, I thought it was my fault. This was the way I was. This was because of who I am. I'm defective. I'm unlikable. It's me. I scare people away. I never had that safety net at home. So I became afraid of everything and angry at everything because I didn't have the safe space. But above all, I had one enemy in particular. Everybody ready to meet him? Everybody ready to meet him? Yeah. Uh, my nemesis, the mirror. Um, every time I look at this, this is why I'd see. Every single day, hated what I saw. I couldn't understand how anybody could like me, want to be around me, hire me, just, eat, just even contact me for any reason. But it wasn't the mirror seeing it. It was my reflection. So it was me. It was my mirror self-image talking to me every time. This was the normal, the norm for most of my life, 30 plus years. Sometimes I would try to fake confidence, it never worked. Uh, sometimes I would act like things didn't bother me, and then they would bother me even more as soon as I could get away from the situation. I couldn't recover for days. Sometimes I would get angry, and by sometimes I mean all the time. Uh, I was paranoid about absolutely everything. You know, something's going to hurt me, I'm going to get fired for this, blah, blah, blah. Afraid of everything. I had very deep valleys. Again, go back to major depression. Two weeks, symptoms present for two weeks, every day for two weeks. I went longer than that. I'm not saying it was a record, that's not a humble brag. I definitely had some, some points that went longer than two weeks. And because of those, I felt useless, absolutely useless, which made me unable to function. I felt like I messed up everything that I touched. I couldn't focus on anything. Uh, I was constantly in fear of losing my job because I couldn't do the job because I had the depression because I couldn't focus. And then I didn't have output, so I started feeling worse. And it's a bad, vicious cycle. Um, and I spent, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was wrong with me. I was a paramedic. Again, that's not a brag. It's, it's what I did for a career. I kind of fell into it. But being in public service, we do not get sick. We help the sick. We don't get mental illness. 
we're above that, we treat people, we're better than that. Unfortunately, I can name way too many people who I worked with who also felt the same way, but they took that final step. They took their lives, they died of suicide, and that these were colleagues of mine in the same field. I was too proud to think it could happen to me. I wasn't confident in anything else, but this, no, I'm too good for that. But something happened. And when I say something, I mean some things happened. It wasn't a single aha moment, it wasn't an epiphany. It was a series of events, but if I could take it back to one particular event, uh, so, I was a paramedic for 10 years. I decided at some point I don't want to do this anymore. I went back to college, got a degree. Uh, but I was pulling into college one day, and it wasn't a test, it wasn't a speech, it wasn't a quiz, nothing, no projects to do. It was just another day of class. Pulled in, and my lizard brain just started yelling, get the fuck out of here. Something's gonna happen, you're gonna die. And I was making excuses to myself. You know, maybe I left the microwave on, maybe, you know, Oh, air conditioning is really expensive. I better go turn it off. Anything that could get me out of there. And put my car in reverse, drove back home, didn't email anybody about it. I just left. Uh, it was a full blown panic attack. It wasn't the first one that I ever had, but this was the first one that for some reason, I don't know why, it just kind of made me, what the hell's going on here? Why? And then I was able to graduate from there and get my first job in development or start looking into it. And to get into it, I started hanging out in online developer communities. I don't know if anybody still uses IRC, but that's kind of where I, yeah, where I, I got started. And I started joining you know, PHP rooms and web dev rooms. And I was able to see, you know, some people come in here acting like jerks, but everybody jumps on them and calls them out for being it. This is an inclusive community. This is awesome. Uh, much more inclusive and understanding and open than my previous life in public service. And this is amazing. Part, being part of this community is amazing. Then I had a health scare. Um, not to go into too much detail, but I found a lump where there shouldn't be a lump and I got scared. And I started reevaluating a lot of things. Good news, it was nothing. Uh, but it did help me get to where I am today. I, after that, I started going to a doctor. I hadn't seen a doctor in probably about 10 years for a physical unless there was an emergency. Um, but I started taking care of myself a little bit. Then, hardest thing, I accepted I needed help. I saw other people living happy lives and not going through the same things that I was. People didn't get angry as easily as I did. People weren't affected by everyday things like I was, and I had an epiphany that maybe everyone else isn't the issue, maybe it's me. You know, if everywhere you go smells like dog shit, maybe you smell your own shoe. Um, and for a lot of people, Including myself, this is the hardest part. All of the signs were there, staring at me, pointing, you know, bright lights, neons, you know, the classic trope on TV, walking down the street with the bright lights, just everything around you. I couldn't see him. Wasn't looking. Tunnel vision. Um, I was constantly afraid. Crippling fear of everyday things. Like I said, the reaction you might get from walking into or walking into a lion pit, I would get walking into a store. Um, Social situations in general were paralyzing, which would make me cancel plans a lot. I would use my stomach as an excuse. Oh, no, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. And the few people that I would hang out with would finally caught up. I'm like, dude, go see a GI doctor because <laughs> oh, there's something wrong. And I was paranoid about everything, which made me not a happy person. Anything could set me off. That lizard brain, fight or flight, feed or breed. If I can't make babies with it or eat it, I'm going to run away or fight. Led to hate, usually a misunderstanding. I did get angry and hateful sometimes, but for the most part, it was just me being terrified and people took that as me being angry and hateful. Because of that, I realized I'd been suffering. There was something that I could do about it, thanks to a wise Jedi. So, finally, I got treatment. I take medication. I'm a huge proponent of better living through chemistry. I see a therapist, I find outlets, I'm active in the Drupal community doing stuff like this, uh, you know, mid-camp, meet-up, all that stuff, and I come out and I start the conversation. So anybody who wants to talk about this, whether it be in here or you know, if we set up a boff later, let's have a conversation. But it was not easy. Because in case you didn't know, the U.S. healthcare system is not amazing. There was a fun period where I could get into a therapist right away. I started seeing a therapist, and they said, hey, you got this, 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 and this, and you need to take this. 
all right, bring me a script doc. Oh, I'm not a doc, and you need to go to your physician. I don't have one. Three months later, I finally get into a physician, knowing that I should be on this medication, knowing that I have a name for it, knowing that this is what I need, but I had to wait. During this time, I attended a talk by Ed Finkler. Do any of you know him? Have you ever heard of him? I'll talk about him. He founded Osme. He's a wonderful guy. He gave a talk at a PHP meetup in Chicago, and it inspired me. He told his story. He was going through the same things that I was going through. He, he took it to the next step and said, I don't want other people to go through this, so I'm going to found this organization and we're going to make, make a difference. But have, being in the room with him, having this talk, getting his information, talking to him, talking with him, helped me realize something very, very important that I never would have thought of before, and that is we're not alone. Since getting diagnosed, getting treatment, and erasing the stigma from myself, I realized I'm not alone, which means we're not alone. And I say we're because statistically, a lot of people have mental illness in some form. Nobody is the only one going through this. To take a PHP analogy, may have different methods and variables, but the interface is the same. I realized that I was afraid because of the way that people view me, and I don't feel that way anymore because of organizations like Osmo. Again, I'll go into them a little bit later, but great organization. So, I'm no longer ashamed of who I am, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here. Before I wanted to hide because of who I am, how I felt, but now I know it's just part of me. I'm not too proud to admit I need help anymore. The valleys aren't as deep. What goes with that is the peaks aren't as, the peaks aren't as high. Uh, so, I still have deep valleys. They're much less frequent than they were before, but if if we're looking at the, the waveform of how it used to be, I mean, if you put, I don't have bipolar disorder, but if you put bipolar disorder is, you know, the peaks and the valleys way down here, what I went through is probably more like this. And during the peaks, have some great times, really productive, I could just get shit done. The valleys took away everything that I did. So now it's more like this with the occasional dip down, occasional uh, jump up, but instead of Small periods of getting a lot done, I have long periods of getting enough done, if that makes sense. Uh, my anxiety has gone down a lot, but it still shows up occasionally. I still have the occasional panic attack. They're much more manageable now. Um, since getting on, on medication and starting to see a therapist, I've become much more comfortable in social situations. Uh, I'm still pretty introverted, so after this, I'm probably going to hide somewhere. Uh, good luck finding me. It, it, if you do, there's a stuffed animal somewhere for you to win. I don't know. I don't have nearly as many anxiety attacks or times when I am unreasonably afraid of doing normal things. I don't feel that I'm going to be mauled by bears by walking into a coffee shop. And now, I work with OSME. This is a big reveal, finally, I get to it. Uh, OSME stands for Open Sourcing Mental Illness. Our, our, the main mission is erasing the stigma around mental illness, specifically in the tech community. It was founded by Ed Finkler, initially started in 2014, Got uh, 501c3 in 2016, became a nonprofit, and it's run by some amazing people. We we do some some different initiatives. The speaking initiative, which is what I'm out doing. We have a couple of handbooks, which I'll talk about a little bit later. We have a few uh, surveys. We put out an annual survey, which really helps out for everything that we do, and you know, fundraising because we're nonprofit and we're broke. But it's a great organization. I, I hope that all of you will look into it at some point. Also, I can tolerate this thing a little bit more. Just a little. <laughs> so I realized, again, I keep saying this, but it's true. We're not alone. I mean this in general, but more specifically in the tech community. Why tech? Why, why is Osme focused on tech? Well, it's been suspected for a long time. There used to be a site called devpressed.com, which was a forum site. Um, that's another thing that Osme does. We kind of, we, I don't want to say absorb because that sounds like we consumed, but we, we brought it under the Osme wing, or yeah, wing, sure. Uh, and now it's Osme forums. But there would be developers who go on there and just, hey, I'm going through this, I'm having a hard time. And there were a lot of people going on there. Uh, and there's something, 
for a long time, creative people, and I say creative in a broad sense, anybody who develops, anybody who designs, anybody who is here right now is a creative. Uh, but creative people appear to be more prone to depression and anxiety. Uh, but before, there was only word of mouth and the, the forums to go on. One reason, one hypothesis, again, I didn't put the citation on here, but I'll be happy to look it up for you if you'd like, uh, is that intelligent and creative people tend to think over situations more than others. As developers, we like to get from point A to point B. As designers, you like to see, okay, if I put this here, it's going to affect everything. What's the end result? We like continuity. And for many of us, we'll replay that, especially if it's a bad thing. Okay, stepping through the code, where did I mess up? Stepping through the code, where did I mess up? But we also tend to not be able to compartmentalize that. We take it outside of you know, our IDE or Photoshop or whatever you're using, and we do it in real life. Oh, bad thing happened, where did I fuck up? Bad thing happened, that was my second F-bomb, okay. Uh, bad thing happened, where did I mess up? How did I get here? We replay it over and over and over again. And that leads to feelings of depression, reliving that event. Um, a lot of people can just let go of things. I can't. I look for that cause effect. I look for why things happen, and usually the end result is blaming myself. Uh, replaying can make us feel hopeless, can make us feel depressed. It can just destroy us inside. And here's the thing that I'm sure none of you have heard brand new words, I'm pointing it now imposter syndrome. Everybody got it? Okay. <laughs> it's. Very high level view, it's a feeling that you don't deserve to be doing what you're doing. Um, I'm still dealing with it, big time. I don't know, my boss just walked out, I don't know why the hell he hired me. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I don't understand how, how I'm at where I'm at. I don't know why you are all sitting here in this room other than people I work with, I think you're kind of obligated, right? Uh, but, you know, one of the big things of it, one of my big symptoms is asking for help. I used to see that as a sign of weakness. If I ask somebody for help, they're gonna think I'm dumb. They're gonna think I'm an idiot. They're gonna just go behind my back and talk about me. Hey, can you believe this asshole? He doesn't know how to do this. But it's not. It's showing you have limits. I guarantee everybody in this room knows something that somebody in this room doesn't. Everybody has knowledge to share. It's, it's common in the developer community. I don't know if any of you are on uh, any you know, larger Slack groups or forums, whatever, pick your your chat program of choice, but you'll notice that an overwhelming theme is, hey, I don't feel like I should be doing this, and a lot of people talk like that. For me, personally, it is an inability to take compliments. If you say something nice to me, I think there's something wrong with you, I laugh and say, no, no. I'm getting better about that. Step one is saying thank you instead of go away, and so I'm, I'm working on that. All right, I've been talking a lot, I need to ring, so I have some questions for you. Would you tell someone with glasses or context, just try looking harder? <laughs> <laughs> Would you ask someone in a wheelchair why they decided not to walk? Would you tell somebody with diabetes or a heart condition to snap, or to stop taking their medicine, just snap out of it? No, I should see all the heads going, no. <laughs> But let's, let's, let's play Mad Libs. Would you tell someone with uh, depression to try being happy? Have you tried smiling? Would you ask someone having a panic attack if they considered trying harder to not have anxiety? <laughs> Would you tell someone with ADHD to stop taking medicine and just try focusing? Have you thought about that? Just try it. In case you're on social media, on the internet, you may see memes. Um, this is an antidepressant, this is shit. This is literally a lifesaver. Uh, I don't need pills to be happy. Good for you, I do. Uh, my personal favorite, what if I told you you don't need antidepressants if you lift? They all say the same thing. It's a decision to feel this way that you don't need help, you can snap out of it, you can just will yourself out of it, why aren't you trying hard enough? But I can vouch for the effects of medication. Now, with that being said, everyone is different, what works for me may not work for everybody else. Some people may benefit from 
just doing exercise alone, you know. Don't skip leg day and you're happy, good for you. But that doesn't work for me. I'm not gonna shame anybody for doing what works for them. Don't shame anybody for if what works for them doesn't work for you. I have a few side effects, yeah. Dry mouth, I drink water like crazy, but the benefits overall greatly outweigh those side effects. Also, we have our own meaning. And if you can't read that, I know that's small text. It says, if you can't make your own neurotransmitters, store-bought is fine. <laughs> so how do we erase this stigma collectively? I, I don't think we're going to solve this problem here today. Just, uh, we need to be stronger than fear. By that, I don't mean beat your fear at arm wrestling, because hopefully we could all do that. I mean, start the conversation. Listen. Let people know that they matter. Uh, don't be ashamed. If you have a mental illness, you're not damaged. You have a disease. Remember, you, it's not a choice, it's a condition. Uh, be respectful. I mentioned earlier person-first terminology. Not all, all disabilities are visible. Not all cuts bleed. You know, sad isn't the same as being depressed. Don't call somebody, oh, you're just mentally ill. You, oh, you're schizophrenic, you're bipolar. No, you are a person with mental illness. You are a person with schizophrenia. You're, you're a person first. That's the biggest thing. Be respectful. The other thing, something that really bugs the hell out of me, is when people compare, you know, I don't want to say minor because everybody, to everybody, their reality is their reality. Their perception is reality. But people who are having a bad day because their baseball team didn't win, that's not the same as having depression. If you like to be organized, that's not the same as having OCD. I did a talk for Marketo, a uh, short lightning talk, and there's a woman who went before me, uh, Marissa Lyman. She has diagnosed OCD. And her talk, I think that they really hated me because they had me go after her because it was amazing. Now, the way that she put it, she didn't go into what her exact compulsion is, but the way she put it is, imagine you're deathly allergic to blueberries. You touch a blueberry, you will die. But some part of your brain is saying, eat this plate of blueberries or everything you know and love will be destroyed. That's OCD. Not liking to alphabetize your DVD collection. Having this compulsion. Uh, I forget the exact you know, DSM-5 uh, criteria for it, but it's having this compulsion. It's you need to do this or you feel that something horrible is going to happen, whether it be a giant meteor crashing into the earth because you didn't eat the blueberry or what, but it's a compulsion. So please, just try to be respectful about that. That's one of my biggest pet peeves. And if you do feel that you have a disease, please get treatment. It helps. Now, my anecdotes are one thing. Uh, you might all think I'm full of shit and just making all this up. So I have science. I mentioned that Osme does uh, a survey annually. Please take it. it the 2017 result, uh, survey had about 800 responses. The 2016 had more than that. So I took a couple questions from 2016 to have a little bit better view of things. Uh, it was made available to several different communities, tech communities specifically, in the United States. And all these responses are self-reported. So, a couple of compare and contrast. Would you bring up a physical health issue with a potential employer at an interview? Not saying should you, it's would you. Physical. No, 37, yes, 23. Okay, not bad, but mental health? Only 5% said yes. Another one, do you feel that being identified as a person with a mental health issue would hurt your career? This is from the 2016 survey because for some reason we didn't put it on 2017, I think we should have, but it's a good question. Now I'm sorry, the fonts are a little bit small, so I'll read them out. Uh, I think it would, 39, it has seven, maybe 41, but only 12% in total, this small slice of pie, thinks that it wouldn't hurt them by being identified. Now this is something that I worry about every time I give this talk, but it's really freeing knowing that all my cards are on the table. If you go to Drupal.tv, a wonderful project, uh, helped out by the Drupal Recording Initiative, shameless plug, Kevin, I hope you're listening. Um, <laughs> But if you, if you search my name, it's going to show up on Drupal.tv under mental illness talks or even just on Google because they did good SEO. Drupal Recording Initiative. It's awesome. Uh, but so it's out there. People can look me up. They know this about me. 
and it feels great that people will hire me knowing all this about me. It is wonderful. I don't have to worry about, are they going to find out that I have this? It's free. Now, you know, out of the hiring stage, do you think discussing a physical health issue with your employer would have negative consequences? Just talking about it. Eh, no, 71%, big chunk of pie. Do you think discussing mental health issue? 41% said no, about a quarter said yes. Five times more think that it would, there would definitely be negative consequences for physical health issues, or mental health issues, sorry. Here, here are some, the, the big ones. These two just amaze me. Um, have you been diagnosed with a mental health condition? The US average as of 2015 is 17.9% of all American adults have been diagnosed with a mental illness in the past year. Uh, this is self-reported, this is about 800 responses. Again, I wanna preface that. Uh, but have you been diagnosed? In the tech community from those who responded, 43% said yes. That's over twice as many percentage-wise as the general population. The next question, do you think you have a mental health condition? This includes the 43% of people who are diagnosed. You can see our 43 there, possibly don't know. So that's a large chunk, only 29% say no, I don't. These two are what concern me, the, the blue and the yellow. Because we're afraid to talk about mental illness. They're afraid to get treatment. Maybe they don't have access to treatment. Whatever the cause is, why they haven't been checked. Hey, I think I might. I don't know if I might, but I haven't gone to see anybody about it to find out. We're afraid to talk about it. But because of these, these facts, it also means we're not alone. I keep saying that, but I can't say it enough. We are not alone. It's mainly for my own benefit. But why are we afraid of this? We're afraid because of the stigma, the stigma around mental illness. You know, we're afraid that being honest will have negative consequences. People are gonna change their opinion of us. If you have anxiety, worrying what people think about you can really be scary. And that, for me, my mind goes straight to the worst case scenario. You know, if it's not great, it's terrible. How many of you have ever had trouble logging into your email? Yeah? When I have a problem logging into my work email, I start sending out my resume because I figure they just didn't tell me. <laughs> that, that's how my mind works. Uh, so like I said, I'm working on that gray area in between the good and the bad, but it's a work in progress. We're afraid that we're get sent to the HR department. How many of you talk with HR on a daily basis or a regular basis even, weekly? Okay, two people, unless there were hands over there. Not a lot. And this could be a good or bad thing, depending on the reason you're talking to them. But I don't think that I could point out my HR person in a room. You probably could, uh, but okay. Uh, I, I, I couldn't point them out in a, in a lineup. And some companies have this mentality that when you, when you disclose a disability, I mean, the second you say, disabled, for any reason, you're covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. If you live in the US, I don't want to assume. Um, but a lot of places, if you say that to your direct supervisor or your boss or manager, however your terminology works, they will, because of company policy, say, stop right there and you'll get a call from HR. So for me, at a previous place of work, I built up courage. I had just been diagnosed and the fact that I was diagnosed and not getting treated was making the depression so much better and I reached out to my boss and I said, listen, I need a day. I just need a day. Here's what's going on. And it happened to me. Okay, uh, I can't talk to you about this. Hung up, got a call from HR. All right, so what do we do here? And then I hadn't met this person since I was hired 18 months previous. I, it took enough for me to talk to somebody that I talked with on a daily basis now I have to talk to a complete stranger. Uh, that's not good culture. Um, so I didn't last much longer there because you know, it, I can't say for sure, which is why I don't name the company, but it felt like after I disclosed, they kind of start finding reasons to, to, to edge me out. That is not good culture. Now, like I said, 
Now, to put a numerical value to this, 17.9%, yeah, that's okay. That's 43.4 million adults, 18 or, or, 18 or over. 43.4 4, in the year 2015. But why should a workplace care? Okay, let's put dollar signs to it. Depression alone, just depression. Remember, DSM-5, the stall. Depression alone impacts 9.5% of the American adult population. It's estimated to cause 200 million lost work days each year, which can cause, cost employers up to 44 billion, with a B, billion dollars annually. We have a number value to it, okay? Take it back to your bosses. <laughs> solve, it, solve all the problems. Now, if you're like this slide, if you're asking, what can we do? Uh, biggest thing, if a workplace creates a culture of inclusiveness, an employee may feel more comfortable being open, not necessarily to everybody walking down the halls and say, depressed, depressed, look at me. No, I mean, maybe talking to their direct supervisors, their bosses, even coworkers about, hey, I'm having a hard time. Or people may be more inclined to look out for each other. You know, hey, I noticed you've been working 24-hour days, you're putting in commits on Sunday, is everything all right? You know, do you need help with something? Anything I could take off your plate? Uh, but that all starts from within the company and it needs to be an entire culture shift. For, for me, I would do very little for days. I'd pretend I was working, I'd fill out my timesheet, but I'd do very little for days. And I'd get angry because I couldn't function, because I couldn't focus, because I just couldn't work. And I'd get afraid of losing my job because I wasn't succeeding. But if the company that I worked for felt, had that culture and I felt comfortable saying, I need a day off, you know, that's eight hours of PTO and 32 hours of productive work compared to 40 hours of me half-assing it, maybe quarter assing it, probably. But that's, that's lost money. All right, so another thing that all of you in this room can do Osme 2019 survey, osmehelp.org slash research. Every response is valuable. It's not a short survey, it's about 20 minutes, but every response is valuable. Helps us know where to uh, focus our efforts. It's in, every year we iterate over it. There's a lot of things that we're going to be adding for next year's, uh, but every response helps. Please take the survey. Now, I don't get a commission for this, um, but another, Part of Osme is we publish handbooks. We have three of them. The collection is $10, DRM free. Hell, you could get them for free if you go to the GitHub repo if you really want to. But the three of them are, prefix, are prefixed mental health and tech. But we've got guide for mental wellness in the workplace, guidelines for executives and HR professionals, and guidelines for employees. The first one is kind of, again, helping to create a culture of inclusiveness. Um, and they are all based on the ADA. So if you're not from America, then it may not be as vetted as your, your country's laws. You know, somebody from Canada was asking about it, and I said, you don't have the ADA, you don't have to worry about it. There, it just happens. Um, but you know, it, it's, they're vetted by lawyers based on the ADA. We aren't just a couple of people saying, hey, I think that this will work. It's great. Uh, Please, take the survey. <laughs> I, again, I don't get commission, I don't get paid by response. This isn't you know, a <coughs> nickel per, per banner. Um, no, it just really helps us focus our efforts. So, everybody got that? Okay. Now, in open source tech, community is our greatest resource. And I had a realization yesterday, we're standing where open source began. This really, really humbling. In open source communities, we take that mentality. We, we work together. We, we are a community. 43% said they've been diagnosed. 19% more of that said, I think so. That's a lot. Again, what does this mean? We're not alone. It also means that we're more than just usernames, which is something that events like this really help remind us of. We're here, we're talking to each other, we're interacting. You know, I, I'm not just seeing a Twitter handle or a D.O profile, I'm seeing you, not ones and zeros. We're real people. We're enjoying each other's company, for the most part, hopefully. Um, you know, having coffee, meeting amazing people. It also means for those of us with mental illness, we're not damaged. And if we work together, we 
keep this, this ship rising, we can erase the stigma. Now, I put a couple resources. Osmihelp.org is Osmi, it's, it's our website. Psychology Today is, um, it's a magazine. The magazine site, last I checked, was a Drupal site, so definitely give them a little bit of a uh, shout out there. But they also have a Find a Therapist tool, which is a very, very granular, faceted search where you can, whatever will make you comfortable with the therapist. And if you've never seen a therapist, your first therapist is probably not going to be your therapist because it takes, it takes time to find somebody who clicks with you, who gels with you. You know, somebody may be recommending something that you're 100% against and it's fine to say, you know what, I don't think this is working out. It's not me, it's you and find somebody new. But, you know, this, this helps to kind of get that search going. Suicide Lifeline, for non-emergencies, if you're having bad thoughts, call that. But if you have a plan, if you're wanting to act, or if you know somebody who has a plan or is wanting to act, please call 911. Also, I didn't mention this, I should have. There's a class called Mental Health First Aid. It's like first aid, but for the brain. Um, it doesn't teach you how to diagnose, it doesn't teach you how to treat teaches you to triage, recognize symptoms, maybe see what early signs of something that may not otherwise be seen or de-escalate situations. Um, it's not a replacement for a doctorate or a psychology degree by any means, but it's a free or donation-based class. It happens pretty often all around, and it's just like a CPR card. It, you have to research every two years or so. Uh, I don't have it. I need to get it. I've been you know, using my, oops. My, my paramedic history kind of as you know, a replacement for that. But, you know, it, it's great. And I personally think that everybody, everybody should take it, but definitely supervisors, managers, HR professionals should definitely have this because you know, one of the things that is really big with developers and people in tech is burnout. And if your supervisor can kind of recognize the signs of burnout, maybe head it off before you get to a point where you know, the candle meets in the middle when you're burning at both ends, that would be a good thing. So I want to thank you all for letting me talk with you. It's been a pleasure. I really, really appreciate it. This means a lot to me. Um, if you want to take the survey, I have a personal survey. I don't have the joint whatever. Uh, just a Google form, bit.ly, JDF survey. And as I said, Osmi is a nonprofit. All I'm going to say about it, if you want to donate to them, uh, osmihelp.org slash donate. It's a great organization. Please look them up. Um, everybody get the picture. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? We only have a couple minutes left. I don't want to go over, but does anybody have questions? Yes? Um, how much do you think the term open source plays into the mental health issue by separating what was the free software movement versus the open source movement, which has no attachment to community? We only have two minutes. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I didn't name it, um, but I think that the, and I'd have to talk with Ed about this, the, the, the purpose behind it was mainly you know, starting the conversation and opening it up to make it a community thing. And I know that open source itself doesn't necessarily have community embedded, but it does bring community together to, to a point. And I think that the, the main reason behind it was, again, to, to make it available to everybody. Let everybody know that, hey, my internal code, this is what's going on. And <laughs> take what I've done and how I've adjusted it, modified it, and see if it'll work. Um, when I initially contacted Ed about speaking, his response was, you know, my deck is Creative Commons. Take it. Go ahead and use it. So I grew up my beard started wearing glasses, and went by Ed for a while. It didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> but I, it, he, we're, everything that we do, too, is open source. Our data points are on Kaggle, so all the survey responses are on Kaggle, which, if not familiar, it's like GitHub for data repositories. Um, and everything we do is open. I think that's kind of a, a big part of it. I don't want to misspeak, and again, this could be a huge conversation, <laughs> but Ed named it. I don't know the exact reasons behind it. I'm just I, wondering if it could be a false connection to a community. You're thinking you have a community and you have open source. Understandable. Yeah. I, that, that would be a question for Ed, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Do 
you do this talk at other um, tech conferences? I do. Uh, for the most part, Drupal events, but I've done a couple word camps. Uh, just recently I did an AWS Community Summit, or Community Days in Chicago. I think it's shining this light on it. Um, any tech conference is going to be huge. Thank you. This is, I, I've been doing variations of this for about two years, and it's, it's been good to me to travel, but also to see all of you people and you know, see people in here. Um, I was fortunate enough to do a version of this at DrupalCon this year too, which was kind of the, the, the way, top of the, top of the pyramid for me. And so I did a complete rewrite after that, so people who did come to see it didn't, didn't get tired of it. Yeah? Um, is this online, the presentation? Yes, uh, Drupal.tv. The, the Drupal Recording Initiative is, uh, uh, so if you're not familiar, Drupal.tv was recently, like within the last six months to a year, put up, and Kevin Thull, owner of this fine equipment here, he goes around to too many camps, and he sets it up for screen capture, um, audio recording, and the slideshow. You know, it goes up on YouTube, which is then aggregated by Drupal.tv, and, you know, separated by camps, taxonomy, blah, 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 buzzwords. But yeah, this and versions of it have been posted online. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say really quickly that uh, over a year ago, I went through what was all awesome help. I'm sure there's a lot more now. And I just felt that the accommodation ideas were like good ideas for everybody. Mm -hmm. Like It's like, this is how you can accommodate people with a mental health problem, but it's a good idea for everyone. And it just, at the return of the question, like, you know, the, the physical disability movement has put a lot of talk about how, like, you know, it's not necessarily the person, it's the environment they're put in right. that's the issue. Um, and so, and, you know, not to take away from the, like, you know, identify a problem, get help and all that, but just some thoughts of, like, you know, how the world being better for people with mental health can right. be better for everyone. So there, um, yeah, it's, it's good that it's going that way. It's definitely a nice way to see things. Uh, and with that, that previous position where I felt like they were edging me out, you know, for anybody in HR, it is not a good idea to prescribe the accommodations. The ADA, I'm paraphrasing, but the requirement of the ADA is reasonable accommodations. Reasonable accommodations does not mean you're going to do this. For me, I work better sometimes when I have a bit of a flexible schedule. It's just the way that I work. But they try to, all right, you like starting early? You're going to be in 7.30, or 7 to 3.30 every day. I'm going to be checking to make sure you're on Slack, which if you are in Slack and you scroll away for a couple minutes, it's automatically puts you as away. So I found a script and I ran it in my, <laughs> uh, in my command line that would check about every 30 minutes and just ping the Slack server with my username. <laughs> uh, but that's, they were keeping tabs on me and it really, really felt dirty. I didn't like it at all. All right, it's, 10.53, I want to be respectful to the next person speaking, so uh, I might sign up for a boff a little bit later if anybody wants to have kind of a roundtable discussion, I'd love to continue the conversation. Uh, let me know, find me, I'm hiding out somewhere. But again, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>